What does it take to create something that never existed before? What does it take to challenge the status quo? What does it take to change the world? This is The Swell Podcast. We're passionate about story, experience, and designing culture, but ultimately how an idea swells into a movement. Take a journey with us as we seek the answers to those three questions through the stories of thought leaders, world builders, game changers, disruptors, and other pleasantly rebellious humans who've ventured out into the unknown on a personal journey to do something novel, innovative, creative, or disruptive. In today's episode, we chat with Mohan Sudabatula, recently named to Utah's 20 in their 20s and founder and CEO at Project Embrace, a nonprofit providing unused medical equipment to those in need. We dive into his own personal journey to start Project Embrace, what motivates him, and the importance of community when setting out to solve a big problem. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast, sign up to our newsletter at theswellpod.com, and get in on the conversation through all of the major socials at The Swell Pod. Our first season is made in partnership with Kiln. Kiln provides flex office space solutions for teams and individuals. Their all-inclusive set of amenities helps startups, creatives, and entrepreneurs alike get work done. Learn more about Kiln at kiln.co. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you enjoy. Before we jump into it, so you ran for public office, is that right? I did. Yeah, what did yeah. you run for? I ran for uh, Utah House District 42, uh, which which takes up most of West Jordan and a little bit of Harriman. Lost in my primary, but that was kind of expected. It was a calculated loss. Uh, but yeah, that was that was an experience. Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Yeah. That's wild. What 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 drove you to like what what triggered that desire to do that? And what did you learn from the experience? Oh, um, so what drove me to do it was, well, I've always had a fascination with politics. I think uh, that's that's ultimately like ever since I was a kid, like that that is the career aspiration is to get into uh, policymaking and legislation. And so I, uh, I, I wanted to run because, you know, similar to most other decisions I make, it's more like a why not um, type of thing. I, I ran as the youngest House candidate ever, and that has recently been solidified uh, because, so fun fact, you have, to be, you have to be 25 to take the oath of office as a state uh, representative in Utah, at least for the House. Um, I ran as a 24-year-old, but my birthday was on November 15th, and the elections just ended on the 3rd. So I ran ineligible, and then if I would have won, then I would have been the youngest you know, representative in all of Utah history. But there was a uh, constitutional amendment that was on the ballot that passed that basically made it so like you have to be you have to meet all the eligibility requirements the day you file. And since that passed, like it is now solidified that like I'm the youngest who have ever tried to run <laughs> at least, uh, which is kind of hilarious. But um, yeah, I mean, like I I wanted to run because, you know, U Utah, especially House District 42, like that, that is that is home for me. Like I. My parents, we, we moved out here when I was like six years old, and um, it, it we were we were the uh, one of the first homes in our entire neighborhood. So you know, t true to Utah, like we were kind of pioneers of the area, and uh, you know, watching it grow and develop, it, it first it felt like you know my family uh, was the one family that looked and lived differently than everyone else. But as like the area started to develop and become more of what it is today. We started to really see that like a nuclear Utah family is that of, you know, kind of my parents' story. Like a lot of people looking for opportunity, a lot of people looking to grow and develop regardless of race, ethnicity, background, but a lot of similar kind of motives and experiences. And so I ran as kind of, you know, the messaging was more my entire life we've elected our mothers and fathers to office, but now it's time to elect our sons and daughters, right? Like let us take the lessons you taught us, the same salt of the earth kind of values and let us take a fresh approach to it, you know? Um, and so that, that was kind of the reasoning and the imaging or and the messaging there. But um, I, again, like I, I ran as I ran as a 24 year old, the, the biggest grievance I had as a candidate was like, well, you, you don't have any gray hairs, which is a lie, <laughs> I'm a lot. <laughs> and, well, I don't, I don't um, see any. I do my best to hide okay. it. <laughs> but I, uh, you know, it was, it was one of those things where like, oh, like you're too young, come back when your time is, is uh, when, when you're ready ready quote you know and um the way i kind of see it is i i'd like to think of it as uh i have this theory about pete Buttigieg and his presidential campaign like there's there's absolutely no way 
uh, just, you know, a, a, a small town mayor from Indiana was going to win the presidency, but he ran a successful campaign and now everyone knows who he is mm -hmm. and, and he's really young. And so if he were to run for a higher position, you know, Senate or whatever, like rep I, I'm pretty sure he'd go for Senate at this point, then he, he's a shoe in he's going to win. And so mm. similarly, I was like, okay, like I know I'm not going to make it, but you know, if I, if I address the critique of he's too young right now, what I really am like, you know, just a, a child, um, that I can come back like 10 ish years from now in my, in my early thirties, still be considered a very young candidate, but I've already dealt with all those issues. Now I'll have more under my belt and the promise of winning will probably be a little higher. Pretty so. strategic move then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a game of chess, not checkers, right? Yeah. <laughs> but you say you, you did it because you kind of think, why not? But you said in your childhood, yes, you always wanted to, to run, you know, or do something within that. Why, why is that? What instilled that in you? Gosh, I think um, that's a great question. I, I've always had a fascination for elected politics. I, I think like it's, uh, it, you know, in my mind, I, uh, okay. So like when I, when I was a student, right? Like I, uh, I wanted to, okay, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a really long winded answer. That's good, <laughs> yeah. But um, so when I was a student, I, I started off wanting to be a doctor. And, um, and uh, basically ever since I could pronounce the word fever, it was like med, med school, that's the route for me. And I was uh, taking a cell bio and physiology class and you know, like the, the take home message of both those classes kind of synthesized is like, oh, everything you are, everything you ever will be is the cyclic flow of chemicals and hormones inside of tiny boxes stacked on top of themselves, like how poetic. And I, um, you know, like, like a, a decom moment, I, I was sitting, in the front row and I raised my hand and I was like, well, what about love <laughs> and like <laughs> and autonomy, willpower, you know, dreams, ambition. And, and my professor just looked at me and he's like, oh, it looks like we have a philosophy major. <laughs> and, like, I, and I was like, huh, maybe you're right. And so I, I declared in philosophy thinking, you know, like, oh, okay, like with the technical know-how of biology and the critical thinking and, and skills of philosophy, like I'll know everything in the world. Uh, not what happened, right? <laughs> like I, I found myself at conflict a lot and, and uh, got really invested in, into the realm of bioethics, you know? So not how do we continue to advance medicine, but like what should we be doing with it and how do we apply it to the greater good? And uh, then uh, as I got further and further into bioethics, it, with it being a relatively contemporary field of academia, quickly realized, you know, I was, I was taking like grad level courses at like the School of Medicine and, and the Department of Philosophy. And I quickly realized, I'm like, well, like this is a very rhetorical field, you know, like it's just us talking to ourselves, but no one is actually applying it mm -hmm. in the real world. And so I thought, you know, like, okay, well, if I wanted, if I wanted to somehow apply the knowledge I have and, and, and govern kind of moral decision making, right? Like what is the best way to do that? And government is, you know, whether we like it or not, is going to be the best way to do that. So I declared in health policy. And, um, and uh, yeah, I, and uh, I, I guess like, that's really it for me. Like, I, I, I care about healthcare a lot, and I care about health and well being. But I think, uh, for me, you know, being an agent of healthcare is great, you know, doctors, healthcare physicians, especially now, right, absolutely necessary. But I think like equally important is you have someone with good intentions and, and the know how making the decisions on access to that pipeline, you know, because like you can have all of the smartest people go become doctors, which is usually what happens. Um, and then uh, someone up top just decides to switch the train track. And now millions of people don't have access to those people anymore, those healthcare professionals. And so uh, I think that, you know, operating in that level and, and making decisions like that has always really intrigued me. And so, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm gunning. And that's uh, that's something I realized at a really young age. Uh, but then I think actualized as a young adult and in like starting Project Embrace and all of that. And so, yeah, that's that's why. Yeah, no, that's good. And you are young, right? But you, when you say when you were a child, like a, before you were a student, when yeah. you were younger, you, you had that desire to make a difference to yeah. um, directly make a difference to policies that would impact people. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, yeah, I know we're young. Yeah, we've already started, so like, <laughs> yeah. that's all going in there. I mean, we're not going to talk about politics, right, the whole time. But no. it's interesting because, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it, there's a lot of really interesting stuff that, that came out of that, right? And, I mean, it, the question that I have is, I think before we get into Project Embrace, but, you know, yeah, you're young, 20 in their 20s, which is important, right? Like, that's huge. <laughs> Thanks. That's insane. But I do want to say, like, um, 
I, I'm interested in where that kind of the philosophical nature kind of started, I guess, mm. right? Like oh, this yeah. idea that, you know, and but then also to the point where, so, okay, yes, it's love and it's, and it's well-being and it's social and, you know, a lot of this stuff that I, I feel like is important to you, right? But mm. um, you also then mentioned this, you know, it's not theory. I'm taking this stuff out into the world, right? I'm taking this out and it's supposed to be very practical. And, you know, so like, where does that come from? You know, where did that originate for you? And, and how did you get to that? That's a great question. I think um, it all, you know, there, there, there's a couple, I think, uh, uh, folds um, where, where this took place. So I, I think it's really, okay, so the Big Bang, right? Like, I, I think, like, that theory is really interesting because it's it's a kind of a sine function, right? Like, there's there's, like, a point where everything was compressed and then, like, it blows up and then everything will compress again and it'll just keep going like that. So I'd like to think, like, it wasn't just one thing mm. that made it happen, but several things, and then it, it, it just kind of cascaded on itself and, and made itself kind of what it is today. And I think like, you know, uh, there will be more moments like that as I grow up and, and expose myself to more opportunities and, and uh, people. But I think uh, w one of the first things that happened to me as a child was, uh, so I'm a, I'm a first generation American. Uh, my parents immigrated out from India and uh, gosh, I think it will be 32 or 33 years in December. Mm. Uh, I was born in Texas, uh, <laughs> which I think is just kind of fun to say. Um, but uh, one, one of my first memories I have of going to India, I was 10 years old, and uh, my mom took me to an orphanage home for uh, disabled children. And, uh, ch you know, just children born with all sorts of congenital birth defects, victims of trauma, what have you. Um, and uh, I remember that was really the first time I had ever kind of seen poverty that close and that, that you know, like in my face. And uh, I mean, I, I, to be totally transparent and honest, we, we were walking the grounds of this orphanage home and I'm looking at children who are, you know, my age or younger, missing body parts or, you know, like walking differently than me. And I, I was terrified, you know, it was, it was really overwhelming. I, I was scared. I really, I hardly looked up from the ground because I couldn't handle what was around me. And it was a very, I think, emotional experience. And at the peak of all of that, I remember I, I, I kind of like tugged at my mom's leg and I'm like, why did you bring me here? You know, like I'm not having fun. I don't, I don't know why we're here. And uh, the director of the orphanage, I think overheard, and he told me something. He was like, you know, your, your parents, they, uh, they donated $5,000, which, which is a lot of money in India, to help build the foundation of a schoolyard for these kids because, you know, a lot of these kids uh, don't have access to education or physically cannot navigate their uh, school system. And so we want to build something here for them so they can have the same opportunities as you. And um, I, you know, like the, being 10, like that didn't really register. And, and my mom then said something to me that I think really resonated years later where she told me, you know, when you get older, or as you get older, you're going to ask yourself a lot of really big questions. Like, what, what's the point in all of this? Like, what's the, why am I here? And uh, like, what's the purpose of life? And there's thousands upon thousands of pages of literature and all sorts of people who will tell you they have the answer, but it's really, really simple. And she told me that you're here and your purpose in life is to serve other people. End of story. Like, that's it. And, and uh, she proceeded, you know, to kind of give me examples of like, imagine like going to school, like a world without traffic, right? Like how weird would that be? Or going to a movie theater, no one's there. Kind of like now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> right? and, like, she was like, you, we, we go through our day to days never acknowledging the background noise, but the moment that noise is gone, you're concerned, right? And so you should always remember that while no one else is really thinking about what else is happening around them, that you need to be thinking about it, right? Because no one else is going to care enough to notice until it's gone. And so um, I think that reverberated. And uh, when I was in you know, college, like my, my uh, freshman year, um, I, was, uh, I was volunteering at an orthotics and prosthetics clinic um, in downtown Salt Lake City at Shriners Hospital for Kids. And you know, I, was, I was making the orthotics and prosthetics for, for these children. And the kind of fickle thing about orthotics and prosthetics, uh, especially for kids, like it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, kids, one, outgrow those things really quickly, um, especially if you know, like they're toddlers or in like the early years of life. And then second, uh, kids are really fussy about wearing that stuff, right? Like they don't know it's, it's rehabilitative or helping them. It just feels weird. And so we would spend hundreds of hours, sometimes thousands of dollars on something for a child 
and then uh, give it out and you know wa watch them walk off to the car, feel really good about ourselves, and then they come back like a month later and say like, oh, like little Jennifer, like uh, she wore it to the car that day and never touched it again, right? Like we need a new one. And then they give us the old thing and it, it would smell like it just got off of a workbench. And uh, it was my job to like take that to the dumpster. And, and I did that regularly. And you know, like all of a sudden, like these visions of these kids from like 10 years ago started to pop back. And I, and I was like, I, I can actually think of faces of people that could really benefit from this stuff. And um, I mean, like that was kind of like the seed of Project Embrace. But I, I, you know, like I've always been a huge proponent and advocate for direct action and, and doing something. Um, and so, you know, I, I, uh, I don't know, like, it's, it's just one of those things where we can, I, I kind of, I follow the model, uh, the motto of, uh, think big, start small and act fast. And so I, uh, you know, like, uh, ch chased an idea and it, and it worked and, you know, I'll chase ideas all the time and more than half the time it doesn't end up sticking. But that's okay. You know, like it's, it's more about doing than scheming, I think. And so, uh. Yeah, that, and that's just something I've been doing ever since I was a kid. So, you mentioned—I mean, that's fascinating. And I'll, I'll say because uh, so think big, act small, and what was it? Think big, act. Uh, think big, start small, and act fast. Right. It's inter it's interesting because you also said you said uh, to care enough to do something about it. Right. Like mm -hmm. there is something really strong and powerful there because I think yeah. So you talk about you can get a lot of ideas and you know, project embrace, like, you know, if, if the seed was, it's like, you're carrying these prosthetics out, out, out to the, out to the dumpster, right? Like, I mean, m most people will probably, you know, just keep tossing it in the dumpster, but there's something to that idea about, okay, so you've, you've identified maybe a problem where you know that you're, you're here to help other people, right? And you care enough to think about the fact that that prosthetic shouldn't go in the dumpster, right? right. But then you also care enough about the idea to go, beyond that, right? To actually put it into action, which I think is really impressive, yeah. you know, but so when you start to think about, you know, we can get into social uh, or to, to Project Embrace, but so do you see, do you find that uh, similarly with, with other ideas that, that maybe aren't around social impact? Do you find yourself just overwhelmed with a ton of other ideas that, that I think that you can care enough about to get really invested into or? Yeah, you know? yeah. And I think like uh, all the time, I, I have this little notebook, um, it's in my backpack, but it just like this little notebook I carry around in my back pocket whenever I see something that is, you know, questionable or can be optimized, whatever, like I'll just make like a little note. More often than not, like those notes don't go anywhere. <laughs> like I'll forget I even wrote something, but you know, I, I, I think that really, solidifying an observation and and then if it continues to eat at you is a sign that like maybe you should do something mm. and so um because you know like we, we come across instances like that every day all the time and so um it, it's i think like a, a mental filter i have for myself is like i write it down and i'm a huge proponent of like the the two minute rule like if a task takes two minutes or less like just do it right now mm. um and so like I'll, I'll usually like just stop everything and write it down and then I'll, I'll kind of just let it sit in my back pocket and in my head and let it simmer. And then if I find myself thinking about it for more than, you know, 48, 72 hours, then it's like, okay, like I should at least investigate at this point. And then um, kind of start from there to see if there actually is a concept there and something that I can chase. And if not, then, you know, like I'll very reluctantly throw that in the dustbin or like put that on like, a, I'll come back later. But um, I mean like that, that mentality is exactly what made me run for office mm -hmm. so young, you know, like I, I, I ran because I, I saw, you know, like, the, and this is just something that's always kind of been like a, a, like a humming noise in the back of my head because I grew up in house district 42. And, um, I, I, you know, I really, I thought about it, wrote the idea down and it, it, it pestered me for so long. And, and then it really just kicked into like, you know, I don't know how to do this. I've never done it before. I've always expressed interests and I've always watched from the sidelines. I've never worked on a campaign. Like I've never, but similarly, like I've never started a business before, right? Like, <laughs> and so I, uh, I, I sat on it and then uh, just started to do it. And it was uh, really kind of trial by fire. But um, yeah, that's, that's usually how I vet the ideas and, uh, and, and, and end up pursuing them. Because the most you have to lose, I guess, is time. But, you know, if you're effective with your time, like that's not really much of a loss anyway, in my opinion. So that, that was actually going to be my next question is about time, because, you know, I guess, yeah, it's like 
you know, so these ideas do come back after 48, 72 hours. There's a lot of filmmakers actually that think about, you know, the stories that they, that they decide to invest years and years of their life into by, does it come back to me? You know, I'm going to throw it away. And if it comes back to me, it's probably worth it. But, um, yeah. So how do you, like, do you, do you put these things like, so yeah, it comes back to you, but I guess it's a question of like, how, how, how do you manage that time, I guess, right? Because I think mm. it's interesting because you are young and I think, uh, I don't even know how old you are, to be honest. I just 25? turned 25, 25 like right. last week. So <laughs> it's it's weird to even say that I'm 25. <laughs> so I think you probably look like, I remember, I mean, it wasn't that long ago, but I do remember being 25, 23, 20, 22. And I looked at time differently than I think, I think yeah. I do now, right? And so I don't know, like, do you think... How, what can you, what, I'm, I don't know if I'm saying, what can you do to help people understand, like, how do you value time or how do you yeah. anticipate that changing for you as you, as you get a little bit older? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. And that's one that I've been uh, trying to dissect myself as of recently, uh, because, you know, as I'm, as I'm kind of planning out like the next stage of life and all mm. of that, like that, that's something. But I, I think uh, for me, it's, it's really, uh, I, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a really big proponent of the idea of like, do the minimum to get the maximum, right? Like that's how I approach school where it's like, if like 92 <laughs> yeah. is an A, like yeah. then get a 92, yeah. right? Like, or whatever, like do, do what is necessary to shave off as much energy and time as possible so you can invest that into something else. And so, um, I, I, uh, I, that's, that's how I approach like all of my ideas as well. You know, like I, I can't, mathematically you can't put 100 percent right. into everything you only have 100 percent, and so um it's about you know like understanding that like you have to like make sacrifices and and make um you know like personal decisions on like where you want to be and who you want to associate with and what you want to do and um i guess for me like it, it was always just it's always just kind of come as second nature like whenever i have leisure time to go and sit in front of a whiteboard and, and just like give myself some some mental space to try and figure things out and unravel things. Um, and, and uh, you know, like I'll, I'll make that social, right? Because like, I think like a social life is important, but you know, mm -hmm. like invite my friends to come come along. And more often than not, I think like a lot of the, a lot of my really close friends, I should say, are people that I've somehow roped into my projects with me, right? Like they're either like friends that I'm like, hey, I think you'd be a great fit or, um, or I'll meet someone through that experience. And then those end up being my really close friends. but. Um, yeah, I, I, I think like it's just understanding that you can, there's only so much time during the day, optimizing your hours, giving yourself like the necessary headspace. Like I, I, uh, I'm trying so hard to be a morning person. It's so, <laughs> so difficult. Like I'm a night owl, which by the way, like aren't night owls like just owls, right? Like all owl, all, all owls are night owls. Yeah. But like I, I, uh, I, you know, like I, I wake up super early in the morning, um, give myself like 20 minutes to roll around and groan <laughs> and then I'll, I'll I'll usually I'll try at least I'm not going to pretend like I'm consistent about it but I'll try and go to the gym really wake myself up because all I'm really good at doing at you know like 5 30 in the morning is driving and grunting yeah. and so and then um I'll, I'll give myself kind of that twilight time and then by the time you know eight o'clock eight o'clock rolls around like I'm, I'm officially ignited and, and, mm. and good to go um, but you know, it's kind of the same process. Like if I wake up at eight o'clock, I still need that, that same amount of time to get going. And so anticipating how much personal time I need to either like warm up or like shut down and kind of building around that is, is uh, one bit of, I guess, like, uh, advice that I would have for people, but yeah. yeah. So, and you, Josh, are you kind of thinking just time? Because it seems like when 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 you're younger, sometimes you just think you've got the rest of your life. Oh yeah. <laughs> do stuff to get stuff done. Yeah. Are you are you kind of observing this more urgent feeling that, that, that he's doing stuff now? Yeah, well, I think I think that's that's kind of it, right? Yeah. But I look at like, you know, I struggle with the idea of too many ideas. I struggle with this idea of like, well, what do I want to do right now? What do I want to invest my time into? But I think what's really interesting is. And, and also from, from, a, from a, let's say, an entrepreneurship standpoint, right? It's like you can consider the, the idea of MVP or you can consider certain things like that, right? It's like you're, you put things into action and, you know, I think you, you've, of course, vetted an idea enough to, of, to, val to figure out if, the, if it's valuable enough to put into action, you know, but you put it into action. And, and I mean, you, 
you you ran for public office, right? And you you've learned from that, and maybe it didn't work. But who's to say that's like you mentioned, right? It's like you're going to you're you're you got value out of that, you know, and and you're learning from that. So I guess it's more about like, mm. yeah, I think it's interesting, I guess, how you look at time and how you also prioritize the things that you want to jump into. Which is really cool, um, but yeah, that's. Yeah. I mean, your brother pops into my mind a little <laughs> yeah. bit. Um, well, he, yeah. both two of my brothers pop into my mind. You probably need to tell me what you thought of. Well, no. So his brother is uh, Greg McEwen. Wrote the book Essentialism. I don't know if you've heard about oh. that. Oh, I have. Yeah, that's your brother. One of my brothers. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. Awesome. Wow. So, but he's, he's got a couple brothers that that have written pretty amazing books yeah. right but essentialism is the one that pops into my mind like specifically as it relates yeah. you know yeah. to my problem with too many ideas but also you know what, what you're what you're kind of talking about as well it's like you know how do you prioritize those those ideas that well, come to you and things like that but, well yeah. i was thinking of this is not a podcast about my brothers yeah <laughs> but <laughs> no what one of my brothers wrote hashtag now mm which is what I think of when I'm hearing you, right? Mm. Um, young and choosing to live by hypotheses, right? Trying to just get stuff done, trying it and seeing. But then there's this also conflict. If you've tried too many things at the same time, you either get burnout or maybe you don't get as far as you can with, with a specific idea. And from an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur perspective, choosing wisely is important obviously to do hypotheses you can quickly test something out see if it's any you know have has its value yeah. has potential value and then you can drop it or or, or, you, or you or you continue to to move on but the, the the difference between those two concepts though hashtag now and and actually essentialism which is being a little bit more careful before you mm -hmm. probably spend any time on anything right there's this there's those two I think there's a tension between those two things right? because you don't want to waste too much time doing too many things. Uh, maybe you figuring out what the right thing is is, 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 is probably one of the priorities, but I don't know what you're It's like, well, what's a priority yeah. now yeah. versus a priority for the next year or two. I don't know, but yeah, yeah. that's a, I think like it's important to soundboard a lot of ideas with other people. Right. Because I, I mean, like at least for me, right, and and I'm sure uh, you both can relate to this, right? Like I'll, all I get uh, ideas about whatever, usually in fields that I'm not a professional in or have any experience in, really. Um, and um, I think soundboarding is important uh, to to develop those friends and and uh, network. I, I don't like using friends and network in the same sentence, but you know what I mean. Like yeah. but to to really soundboard uh, different ideas and perspectives to see if there really is something there. Um, and I, I think more often than not, the best ideas are the most provocative ones, right? Like, so the ones that get the most mixed reviews are ones that I'm really interested in. Um, but I, uh, I think, you know, I, uh, especially with the recent, like, 20 in their 20s recognition, um, I also wrote an article for Silicon Slopes magazine a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, a year ago, about um, being, uh, you know, start, starting a business in, in college, and I think... Um, it's one of those things, and like this especially applies to yes, like those who are in college, but like I, I think it applies to everyone, right? Um, who, who's younger, is uh, you as as a young adult, you straddle a really interesting line. Um, I think as an undergrad, I really notice this, right? Where if you are a student and you're trying to pursue an idea, you get like this, you get the treatment of both being a child and an adult, right? Like this this uh, blind optimism and encouragement of being a child of like, oh wow, like you have something. Like, how can we help you, right? Versus you get all the resources of being an adult trying to pursue this, right? Um, but if you're, you know, just a child, you're not gonna get those resources because no one takes you seriously. But then if you're, if you're uh, just an uh, adult, and I use air quotes here, right? Uh, then people are a lot less forgiving, uh, I think, or a lot more, uh, I, I think like there's, there's a lot of skepticism around the idea. And so I think, uh, you know, pushing for, for wanting to do different things while you're younger and more so as a student, um, that that gives you the best of both worlds, you know. And so I think uh, there is an urgency, I think, uh, in to, for me at least, to try and do more and to try and push more when I'm younger, um, and to really vet the ideas though, because I don't want to just tread my wheels on nothing, um, because uh, there there is a community around me that wants to see. Um, everyone younger succeed and wants to see people grow and is looking for that, you know, next gen leadership. And so, um, yeah, I, I, uh, 
I think when in doubt, it, it's more just try it and give it a go and fail quickly and, and learn from that, right? Like yeah. no failure is uh, truly, I think, a loss, right? Uh, I, I think uh, with failure, take away the emotional charge of that. Like there's always something to learn in both a, a win um, or a failure, but it's never a loss. And so, um, yeah, that's that's kind of that. I, I It's a little chaotic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, so, yeah. It sounds like a lot of, in relation to you know most businesses um, are using agility, design thinking, design sprints of just you know, that's what it makes me think of or at least around the test and learn and encouraging people to just spend as a small amount of time exploring uh, options, avenues, uh, and and seeing what what works and what doesn't, and then makes a decision. I will challenge this one thing though, mm. <laughs> which is you know I think you represent a younger generation. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what you actually said around doing, you know, challenging yourself now to, to explore things and, 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 and uh, experiment with things are actually applicable to any age group. In fact, Absolutely. it's very Absolutely. applicable to your 30 year old, your 50 year old, your yes. 70 year old, someone stuck in a corporate job or stuck in a, in, 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 in a company that they're not found, that they, they didn't found. Or it, it really, the question is, what don't you think Josh, that around, what are you doing now? To, 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 to follow your your passions, your purpose, your questions, your curiosity. I mean, like, what are you doing about it? Right. And, yeah. and it doesn't matter what age you are. Yes. Yeah, I do agree with that. I think, I think there is this, just this phase of life, though, that you go through, you know, between 18 to, like, 20, what, what is it, 24, where experimentation, like, I think you are programmed as, as a person to figure out like and to challenge and to disrupt and 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 to believe that you can change the world like i think that's just part of what you go right. through i mean as 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 an 18 to 24 year old which i think is a really important thing and and i, I do agree i think at every age you can you know you can you can you can you can do those kinds of things um it but, probably but just often takes don't. but also because i think what you mentioned right there is there is a risk to it there is a heightened sense of risk because as you get older you know, failing, making mistakes, it costs you, it costs your family, it costs your right. mortgage, it costs like, you know, so there's a, there's a definitely a period of experimentation and, and massive opportunity for failure with less consequence, I think, at a younger age. I, yeah. guess. I mean, that's kind of how I, how yeah, I, 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 I agree. I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, isn't you're never too late Absolutely. to start right now. For sure, I agree with you. <laughs> to do something, you. and you're yeah. prime at that age I to agree. do it. Yeah. And, and you, but you're, you can advocate what you're doing is it, it, all the way through your life to advocate. It's actually about now. It's not about yeah. anyway. Yes. Yeah. For sure. I think <laughs> the, the biggest thing is, you know, at, at any given age, it's just this, uh, you know, people, you, we, we can evaluate it off of like the scale of like cost benefit analysis, right? But I think like the bigger underlying like demon that stops a lot of people, whether they're younger or older, is um, the idea of like just stigma, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, it's like why would you want to like in 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 your like early uh, in your early twenties, right? Like it's like oh, it's about trying to find like your niche. Like why would you want to like wh why would you want to like experiment and lose time during like this otherwise very critical decade of your life? But then when you're older, it's like oh you 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 have it figured out. Like why would you want to risk that? And it's just about overcoming, I think, the stigma every time and. Uh, if you can do that, then you you will you will always find a way. Like I think it's uh, you know, you you'd be surprised at how much pe people always dread. I guess like being forced into a corner because they're like, what am I supposed to do, right? Like if I'm forced in a corner, but then uh, you'd be surprised at like how elastic you are when you're actually in a corner and like yeah. what your body and mind can actually do. Um, and then you know if you if you constantly like go there as like your training space, uh, mentally, entrepreneurially, whatever. And the moment you're given resources and like room, then you're so you're you're way more capable and creative, I think. And so, um, yeah, that's I, I I agree. I think it it can and should happen at any given age, and no matter where you are in life or who you are in life, uh, right? Like it's uh, just about overcoming the stigma that uh, trying something new, and uh, you know failing at it perhaps or succeeding, um, is not of really. Re, like substantial consequence to to who you are as a person, but rather a growing opportunity every time. Yeah. yeah. Well, you said something about the best ideas. What What did you say? You believe the best ideas are the most provocative. The most provocative. Yeah. Yeah. So that's interesting. I think, right? Because 
if I ever were to think about that, like provocative in the sense that you, it's very polarizing. You have people who agree it's a good idea or, or a world changing idea versus a, a group of people who are maybe not willing to change the world in that sense. Could you, uh, I guess, uh, elaborate on like, if, if you were to think about that, like is pro like project embrace, was that is, did it have that provocative nature for oh, yeah. you when you oh, were in it? Oh yeah. yeah. So I think like there, there's a, there's a very key, key difference between provocative and controversial. Yeah. Right. And so like understanding that that line, you, you dance kind of the razor's edge there, right. But like knowing what side you want to fall on is important. But, uh, in con in context, like project embrace, when I first had the idea, right. Like I, I, uh, saw it, you know, as I'm uh, throwing all of these things away, the first thing I did was I went and talked to my, uh, you know, mentors and supervisors in the in the medical profession, and I was like, hey, like, uh, why don't we, you know, just take this stuff and put it somewhere else? <laughs> and, <laughs> That's a great idea. You know, like, like, um, I like and it. Uh, it, it just was uh, one of those things. And I guess I should also say, right before I go further. Um, provocative does not necessarily mean groundbreaking mm -hmm. either, Yeah, you know? And, and that's, I, I'm a huge, I will say this every time about Project Embrace, it is not a groundbreaking idea to say, hey, like, let's reuse this wheelchair, right? Because like, that, that's just as unique of an argument as like, Josh, you're sitting in this chair, right? <laughs> it's just like, more than one person should be able to sit in that before you throw it away, right? Like, oh, wow, <laughs> revelation, right? But um, I think uh, when, when I was talking to the healthcare professionals in my immediate proximity, I got, um, a lot of kind of pats on the head of just like, that's cute, but come on, like someone has to be doing this already. Like it, it's so simple. It's so simple, right? Like you, you really can't have been the first person to thought, uh, think of this. And um, I, I got that from a lot of people just like this. I got, you know, kind of the, the, the downplay, the, you know, like the, the negative side of being so young of just like, ah, like look at you trying to figure out the world. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, but then, you know, I, I extended that to kind of my greater community and got a lot of, oh, like, finally, I, I have this stuff laying around in my house and it's been there forever, usually because a loved one has passed away. Like my grandpa passed away and I have his wheelchair. And we don't wanna, we don't wanna throw it away because it was a huge part of his life, but no one will take it. Maybe now someone can take it. And so I just, I, there, there were two gears that were moving together, but, you know, like this dark spot in between both of them. And I wasn't sure like what was connecting them or why. And so um, with Project Embrace, right, like I, I, uh, I first spun it as a research initiative. Um, I, I approached the Department of Global Health um, uh, at the University of Utah and, and in the School of Medicine. And I was like, hey, like I have this theory, you know, like uh, reusing sustainable medical devices and materials um, to close healthcare gaps in low resource settings and developing countries, communities everywhere. Like, and, and I, I uh, my, my background is really in research, right? And so I, you know, like uh, created a nice little poster and, you know, like developed a framework around the idea and uh, started just applying everywhere to expose myself to more experts. And, uh, you know, like uh, the, uh, my first, like debut with the idea was on, um, was on the state, was on the state hill and uh, you know get, getting feedback from Democrats, Republicans, and politicians about the idea. And then it was the University of Utah School of Medicine, Hopkins, and it just kind of cascaded. And before I knew it, I, I was at Oxford University. And um, I, I talk about this a little bit in my, in my TEDx talk, but it was a real pivotal moment for Project Embrace where I, was, um, I had an audience of people and it was just hilariously split. Like there's, there's a middle walkway and there was a podium and I was standing at the podium. And um, on one side of the room, you had America, like all the American scholars. And then on the other side of the room, you had the greater EU. And I'm talking about Project Embrace. And, you know, I, I get to the punchline of, ah, yes, like, let's reuse these devices. Why are we throwing them away? And, like, you would see, you know, the North American side, like, everyone kind of pulled out their notebooks. And they're like, huh. And, and then on the, on the European side, I remember just, like, looking at... Uh, right in the front row of speakers, right? Like, uh, or, or uh, of the audience, we had our keynote speaker and he just looked at me and he was just shaking his head. <laughs> and and like, I, like, I was just so, I was really taken aback. Like he didn't clap, he didn't do anything. <laughs> and um, later he actually came up to me and was just like, look, like this is a great idea, but you know, like this, this is happening. This is happening already. Are you telling me it doesn't happen in North America? And I was like, what do you mean? And, and um, I, I started to really dig into it. I signed up for some more classes at the School of Medicine, particularly in global health and, and in uh, health policy. And 
learned very quickly that um, the United States is the only developed nation in the world that does not have comprehensive health policy on, on a governmental level, right? And um, I think uh, there's a lot of consequences to the idea, you know, like regardless of political stance, and one of them is the hemorrhaging of medical resources in this pipeline, right? Like we, we put such an emphasis on production of these things and then when you get it in the United States, it's yours to keep. Your insurance purchased it. It's now your item. But in uh, places with, uh, you know, like the single payer system or, or more socialized forms of medicine, um, it's not anyone's in particular, right? Like the government paid for its production in taxes and everyone's taxes. And so um, when you're done, let's say, using this thing in, in let's say, uh, Chile or, or the UK, Mexico, the expectation is you give it back to the hospital so then they can clean it up and get it to another patient and do that until it's no longer safe. And so um, Project Embrace then, you know, we, we basically salad picked the best practices from um, different international healthcare systems and made a nonprofit model, right? Because in, in this kind of existing for decades uh, and, and for generations in some countries, one of the things that we quickly noticed was, okay, well, if you're in the UK, you, you need to be recognized by the government to be served, right? Like you need to be a citizen, you need to be paying taxes. So if you are, you know, uh, uh, if, you're, if you're a refugee or you're undocumented um, or you're not paying taxes for whatever reason, unemployed maybe, you're not going to get that assistance and you're kind of on your own and, and there's no safety net for you because the net is supposed to catch everyone that participates. And so Project Embrace, quickly became, you know, like one of five nonprofits in the world and, and the only in the United States to work exclusively to try and solve this problem, right? Because like what we what we do now is we target disenfranchised communities in these areas and we, we play mimicking bird and uh, kind of act as the grout where people fall through the cracks, right? And so uh, now everyone, those that pay taxes and those that don't, receive the same basic level of care when it comes to durable medical equipment. And I think uh, that's what helped blossom Project Embrace. And so like the, the provocative nature idea came into play where just like, this isn't really on the bleeding edge of anything. And, and, uh, and people, healthcare professionals, both back home and around the world kind of all agreed on that, but no one knew why. Everyone just kind of assumed the problem was being taken care of when in reality it wasn't. And so, um, yeah, and, and uh, here we are, you know, three years later, but uh, that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at with provocative, right? Like provocative is not groundbreaking and it's not necessarily controversial either, right? Like you, you, you talk to anyone regardless of what state you live in. I mean, like we, we started in Utah and we're advocating for healthcare for all, but no one disagrees with us, right? Because there's nothing polarizing around the idea of we should help each other, right? Like if you have the means to do it, wouldn't you wanna do that? And uh, everyone can get behind the narrative of wanting to help a fellow human being. So it's, uh, it's about navigating the delicacies and, again, staying on the side of provocative but not controversial. Well, I mean, what I like about that approach, though, is the cherry picking, the, the exploration, you know, traveling. Maybe, maybe it started when you were 10, right? The, the, the seed of the desire to travel, to, to go and see other, to go and see and feel other uh, the experiences of other people, right, in, in, in different circumstances, but the ability to be able to go and actually ex listen and explore other systems, healthcare systems, uh, can be applied to anything, right? Go and look at how other families do things or how other businesses do things in, in this industry and in another industry and, and, and actually pick the things that work, right, best practices and apply them elsewhere. Second thing that makes me think of is, is really the importance of making it I mean, whether or not people were doing it or not, because I'm, I'm sure there are charities mm -hmm. around the world, right? Even churches yeah, yeah. that do distribute maybe this type of equipment, but yep. but they're not doing it for everyone. Yeah. Uh, and what when it really becomes real is when you see real people that are in real need with a real name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, they need something, and then then it makes it. I think maybe that was a part of your desire to actually then uh, fulfill that need when you know. Someone, I, I always say, if you can't, if you don't know someone's name or you don't, if you've never met them, how can you really care about them right. as much as you would if you actually saw that child that needs it, and, and then you made it real, right, and, and applied it. Exactly. Um, hmm. well, I mean, that's maybe we can even go in, go down that route yeah. too, right? Like, I, I'm sure you've, like, I, I saw 
the the recent work that you guys have done with the Navajo Navajo Nation. Yeah. Um, but going back to like the idea that you're here to help others and through everything with Project Embrace, through a lot of the projects that you've been involved in, are there like what is that like? You know, being so close to providing things that people actually really need. You know, like do you do you have any? Uh, do you build up like really strong personal connections with some of the people or is it like how, how, yeah, what is, what is that like? Um, it's, it's really interesting. Cause I think, you know, one, one of the biggest uh, concerns that I always am thinking of with project embraces is one of two things, right? Like one is, um, are we actually helping, <laughs> mm. you know, like how, how do we know we're not just, uh, the, the term is bio dumping. So yeah. like taking, you know, like medical equipment that is considered excess in one community and then dropping off in a community that's um, you know, less capable to handle that capacity of medical equipment and then just dropping it there and it not doing anything and creating clutter and trash um, as like one thing. And then the other thing that's along with that is, you know, cultural sensitivity um, around the idea, right? And, and like, how do I not become, you know, like the savior, right? And, and I think like a, um, a more like a token term is the white savior complex, right? But, you know, as a person of color, like that's something I think of all the time. Like I come from a very privileged perspective and background how do i know that i'm not that when i show up i'm not like uh, putting out a local industry and how do i know that i i'm actually helping um and uh, you know like we've integrated that kind of into the backbone of project embrace of really researching and really getting in contact with the community because it, it's one of those things where especially if you're working in a highly populated area where um there is you know like a need or or some urgency it's really, e no one's ever gonna say no, you know, like you show up and you're like, I have these yeah. things. No one's going to reasonably look into that and, and say no, people will always accept a helping hand. And so, um, you know, like that, that is always, that's something that I, I try to think of on a, on a regular basis before we intervene. And, you know, for Project Embrace, I'd like, I, I really push the idea of we are not a, uh, a destination oriented charity, right? Like we are, we are a nonprofit that works specifically with um, certain populations that have the most urgent need. And uh, that makes us travel all over the place, but we're never looking to go somewhere uh, exotic, you know, like it's, uh, it's, it's wherever the need is the most urgent. So like, for example, with the Navajo Nation, my team and I are gearing up to head out there uh, December 13th and six, uh, through 16th of 2020, um, right before peak flu season, um, because we were out there in July, we went out there the 4th of July weekend, and, uh, you know, th these are our neighbors that are just like 400 miles south of us, yeah. right, in Salt Lake City, and uh, they are single-handedly the most adversely affected community because of COVID, and I mean, the, the Navajo community and, and indigenous, uh, indigenous uh, peoples everywhere are always, they're, they're always just dealing with the worst circumstance because of neglect and disenfranchisement and oppression, um, but especially now during COVID, it, it's, it's especially heartbreaking um, to, to just see what's happening and how the community has coped with this, right? And so the, the observations that um, we had when we went out in July, and we took out a pretty small sample of medical equipment, right? Like uh, it, it took us three days and, you know, like less than $1,000 to travel to the Navajo Nation. We took out roughly $8,000 worth of medical equipment and service. Um, and uh, we, we talked to a lot of healthcare workers in the community and we were talking about, you know, what's it like right now? What's going on? And, um, you know, like it was, it was really tough. Like uh, just, you know, 50 miles north of the community or, you know, not 50, maybe, maybe like 100 or so is, is Blanding, Utah. Mm. And um, that is a primarily rural, very white town. And people were up in arms about how there was no 4th of July celebrations and how they had to wear a mask. Right, and um, then, you know, just like 400 miles south, people are dying around the clock because people don't realize how quickly the disease can spread from one community to another. And I think that there's like this false sense of geography where, you know, in Salt Lake County, we're surrounded by mountains, so we can really see the end of the community. But when you go out to Southern Utah, especially Blanding, like it's just a flat horizon and you feel like you're so far away from everything, but that's just not the case. And so um, what we really started to notice um, when we were out there in July was the basic triage of care and healthcare has kind of shifted, you know, like whenever subsidies or money has come into the community, particularly that of the Navajo, um, all of that has been kind of geared towards coping with and dealing with the outbreak of the pandemic, right? 
uh, but then basic healthcare needs like getting wheelchairs or, or um, other just medical equipment for day-to-day -day activities has been pushed aside or, or reserved for a later time. And so, um, you know, people will show up to whatever hospital, travel hundreds of miles to get to a hospital that has their resources and have to wait weeks, uh, you know, to, to get like a wheelchair and, and have to like camp out in the parking lot. And it just, for us, we saw it as like, look, like we understand that these healthcare professionals are doing the best they can and they're doing what they need to be doing. And we're not here to tell them how to do their job or we're not here to train them on anything, but we're here to up their capacity to serve their community, right? Like no one should have to wait that long to, to get you know, a wheelchair or a set of crutches or, or commode for uh, you know, their grandmother who's bedridden, right? Like let's help everyone at the same effect, uh, efficiency that we can. And so um, I, I've learned really quickly and, and through, you know, like, again, like taking different classes on this and in praxis that it's uh, you, the way to avoid, I think, the uh, savior complex is to identify the need with the community and then see if you're a good fit and, and uh, kind of go from there, right? Like we if, if we, if we came to the conclusion that our service was not necessary and actually improving the quality of life for patients, like we would not be going out there. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the more, I think, rewarding um, experiences of Project Embrace is, you know, uh, Darwin had this theory of like the six universal expressions of people, right? And so like, uh, regardless of cultural linguistic barriers and all of that, you will always be able to know when someone is truly grateful for your service, regardless of if you can communicate in language or not. And that, the expression of gratitude and, and the, I don't know, just the excitement around getting like a, a, a new medical device or a restored medical device from Project Embrace has always just been so heartwarming. And it's uh, one of those things where you, you, you kind of get a, a little like high off of it, right? Because uh, um, you, you're really, you get to see the impact right in front of you. But um, that's always short lived, right? Like it's about thinking about the greater uh, consequence of your action. And now, you know, like some of the stories that we've heard in the past, like uh, there's, this, uh, there's this woman on the Navajo Nation, or in the Navajo Reservation who um, she had to get piggybacked everywhere from her husband to get out of the house um, because they didn't have a wheelchair. And uh, whenever they got like a wheelchair or something, like it just could not handle the terrain of the reservation. And so she piggybacked everywhere with her, with her husband. And then um, unfortunately her partner passed away and she didn't trust anyone to uh, piggyback her anymore. And she, was, she, she stayed indoors for the greater part of you know, three or five years. And uh, then we had like an all-terrain wheelchair and um, we were able to get that out to the family. And you know, for the first time in so long, she was able to go participate and engage with the community. And uh, during really troubled times with COVID, you know, like we're, we're not researching the vaccine. We're not, we're not giving away the vaccine, um, but we are making sure that during such a tough time for everyone that we are establishing a greater sense of participation and community because uh, really, at the end of the day, we ha all we have is each other and, and the people we are surrounded with and want to make sure that that quality of life is still there for everyone, regardless of circumstance. So, yeah. Just great. Yeah, it's a Back down to a really great human story though, right? Yeah, it is a strong. Whatever we do, who's the need, you know, who's the person that needs this? You know, to solve the problem, it brings it home. It make, makes it real. That's what seems so interesting, yeah. right? I, th I mean, it just I, in regards to like this idea of you, you, how much you care, like about your about your customer. Let's say, right, the person who's receiving your equipment, right? There, there's a lesson in in that human centricity, that customer centricity, mm -hmm. that I think any business, like, it's so interesting that you that you that you're there right now, right? At how young you are and. And I think what, with what you do, and I, 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 you know, of course, I attribute that to you and, and the fact that it's a social impact, you know, social impact organization, right? But I don't know, it's, it's, it, is, it is interesting because I think a lot of organizations out there aren't even close to, as, as close to, you know, their customer as you are to the, to the people that, that you're helping, right? It's really fascinating. Yeah, also um, a good reminder that, I mean, again, I think of, there are, even if you think of a business, there are there are lots of businesses doing certain things already. It doesn't make the world's a big place, and there are lots of needs unmet by that service, that product, and so there is space in the world to make a difference. 
uh, and and of course you know, potentially to make you know, make a profit as well if if it's uh, depending on what your business is and what what, what it's about. Um, I, I wonder if this is a moment where we decide w which way to go. <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple ways, yeah. <laughs> I think if tech, I'm wondering like what what's next, what technology do you think could actually help you scale your business? Um, it, it, I am also wondering about even the lesson around the research, right? You you thought you knew something in Oxford, but then you yeah. realized there was a gap. You you know kind of failed to explore that avenue and you've learned from that. And do you do things differently with your research now? But what, what else are you thinking? Because we'll vote <laughs> where we go next. <laughs> well, it's interesting because, you know, I like the, the provocative nature of the idea. And but I really especially like the idea um, around. I think it was a line in your TEDx talk. It was a line around the it takes an individual to recognize a problem. Let the community realize a solution. Yeah. yeah. And I, I look at the way that you that you you picked you know, from the, the world as a community, right? The best practices from that, and it ultimately helped you, helped inform what Project Embrace was. Yep. But like looking at that, that cross-pollination um, as, a, as a means to innovation, I think is interesting. Yeah. Mm. Should we vote for that one? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, what, are you, what, what are you interested in talking yeah, about? Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, I think, well, I mean, uh, that, the, that kind of conversation around cross-pollination and, and uh, you know, like deriving to that conclusion, I think informs a lot of what next steps are also for our organization. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, like that, that's, I see that as like kind of a two for one. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think like I could, I could, I could sprinkle a little bit of, you know, like the, the pivoting and adaptivity that uh, Project Embrace has had to see and kind of where cool. we're going. Yep. So like we, we could we could like kind of do all of them if we string it that <laughs> let's way. String it, let's let's, let's it. string it that way. Yeah, I love yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, you know, I, I think, um, you know, for, for healthcare, and this is something I, I think like uh, one of the really big things that I struggled with in the beginning stages of Project Embrace is this idea of imposter syndrome, you know, mm. uh, and that, that's every, that's something everyone can relate to, um, but particularly because, you know, I was surrounding myself with MDs, PhDs, and the, the first, um, I think, like, real academic conference um, that, that occurred out of state, so it was, it was at John Hopkins um, in, in DC, right? Uh, I remember, like, I had, my, I had my poster set up, and I uh, locked myself in the bathroom for, for like, half an hour, because I was so overwhelmed, and, and you know, experiencing some serious symptoms of like an oncoming panic attack um, because I, I just, I felt like it didn't belong. Like I was the first time, it was, I was by myself and, um, and, and it just, you know, like I had to answer all of the questions and I had so many questions too. And like, um, but yeah, I, I uh, you know, I quickly kind of came to the conclusion that it, it doesn't take a, uh, very, it doesn't take like whatever like uh, professional degree or, or uh, you know technical know-how to be able to talk about things that universally affect all of us, and so um, I, I I built that into the foundation of Project Embrace of again you know like it takes one person to to recognize what's happening around the world, but it takes all of us to try and solve the issue, and um, I think that that is especially relevant in healthcare right, uh, especially around political discourse like a lot of people everyone has an opinion on, on like how healthcare ought to be run and what should happen. But then we defer to, uh, you know, supposed experts to try and uh, come up with a solution. But the reality of it is like, even the experts have a hard time coming up with answers because it's something that everyone needs to kind of pitch into um, as far as a actualized solution goes or even thinking of a solution, right? And so I, uh, I really made it a point where, you know, Project Embrace does this thing really well where you know, let, let, let's say we pick up a wheelchair or a set of crutches from whatever, uh, you know, family in Draper, Utah, uh, where it's just like, uh, you know, uh, Jonathan's mom decided, reached out to us because he had a soccer accident and now they have a boot and crutches and he's all healed up and playing again, but they don't know what to do with it. And, and so they give it to Project Embrace, we slap a serial number on it, put it through our process, and then it ends up going somewhere. And then we, because we've identified where it came from, how many hands have touched it and where it ended up, and uh, sometimes, right, like who it even goes to can send like a little postcard or, or like a little like notification of just like, hey, like, did you know that this is where it went and this is who it's helping? How cool is that? And um, that I think is a really powerful uh, 
thing that we can provide as an organization because it shows people that absolutely everyone can and and every little gesture does have an impact um, and, and that it, it translates to, to something a lot more meaningful. Um, and so I, I'm a huge proponent of that. I, I think uh, that's what really helped me overcome my imposter syndrome. And similarly, it's like one of those things where you know, you, you have like a line of experts and, and like a, a line of just everyday people uh, like myself, right? And, and uh, someone's just like, I have this problem. Like who wants to step up to the plate and talk about it? Like I'm looking for someone who is qualified and cares and whatever. And more often than not, like everyone just kind of looks at each other just like who's gonna step up, right? Mm -hmm. and, and before you know it, like it, you, you step up to the plate and you may not be the most qualified, but in talking about the problem and in talking about the solution or ideas about the solution, you somehow become the most qualified or at least everyone believes you're the most qualified and now you are. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I think like uh, the, the cross, pollution of you know industry and and private nonprofit and public sector is super important i think that there is a, an untapped potential in being able to build off of each other's weaknesses to to solve greater problems right like the problem with the nonprofit sector is there's never enough money <laughs> the problem with the private sector is it's only about money and then the problem with the government sector is it takes too long and so they're understanding each other's weaknesses and kind of Achilles heels and, and picking the best of each and trying to address the problems of each is I think the most effective way to come up with any solution regardless of what sector you're in. And it takes collaboration and conversation um, from across all different silos, right? Uh, you, gotta, you have to break down those walls to try and build something. And um, yeah, I, I, I uh, it's, it's one of those things where I, I think, you know, Project Embrace, one, one thing that I, I uh, am currently not a fan of with Project Embrace is it, it, it really just kind of addresses symptoms of a greater problem, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, we are, we are providing um, a vehicle or vessel to increase the quality of life for whoever we're helping, and that's important, don't get me wrong, but that problem will continue to persist. Or what happens when that wheelchair mm. breaks down, right? Like, do we just keep going back? Like, you, you, can, you can make money off of that idea, right? But it's not solving a systemic problem. And I, I've, I've always been someone who advocates for systemic uh, issue solving, right? Which is, which is my fascination with public policy and politics. And so I think uh, what, what we're doing next is we're, we're looking at a couple of different kind of strategies here. And th these are the ones that are floating around in my notebook, um, but I know like my, my fellow team and uh, other leaders in the organization are thinking about as well. And we're gonna revisit this actually in Q1 of 2021. But you know, do we, do we try and expand our services that we provide um, outside of just durable medical equipment and, and you know, rehabilitative services to you know, like, let, let's talk about like access to insulin or, or access to um, you know, like feminine hygiene products or like contraceptives, like education. You, do, do we start to, there are so many kind of tiles that Project Embrace is adjacent to right now and we can easily kind of expand our vision and, and curriculum into those areas and become a more encompassing thing. And you know, like before we know it, Project Embrace is, we have a massive R&D department and we're, we're, we're picking apart private and government practices and maybe other nonprofit practices and trying to find ways where we can innovate there. Or, you know, like an, another path that we're, we're looking into is do we, do we push for a more systemic solution here? You know, like uh, we, we were talking about earlier how um, the idea of helping people is not polarizing. And I think uh, the idea of, you know, like politics in general, like red versus blue, everything's very binary. It's either yes and no, and that's really not the case. I think party politics are weird. I almost ran as a Republican uh, because like I'm fairly indifferent to the idea of a party. Uh, it, it's just more like where are the better odds here? Like where could I have succeeded yeah. better? And so I ran as a Dem. Um, but I think it's it's the idea of you you need to. Uh, I really like the I really like the term like cross pollinate. But at the same time, like you can you can also draw parallels with that idea of reach across the aisle, right? Yeah. To work with conflicting agents and uh, to find a greater solution. And so um, you know like there's a potential for Project Embrace to try and push for you know, legislative action and, and really like lobby for s solutions that will affect the greater state, right? Um, and uh, you know, we're, we're looking at like, what does that look like on the state level, right? Um, what, what populations are we trying to serve and address? And it, it, you know, it's not necessarily like the idea of, do we close the loop, right? Like, 
do we convince uh, the state legislature that like, hey, like this hemorrhaging is bad, can we close it? But more, you know, like the moment we do that, the people that we help anyway are still are still in trouble and need help, right? But rather like, okay, like how do we use, you know, like the state's resources to perhaps identify these problems and, and the data to identify these individuals, but then as like a nonprofit or perhaps like a coalition of nonprofits and private businesses, we can, we can reach out into these communities that, you know, like the, the Navy sleeve white glove arm of the government just can't or, or, or shouldn't. And uh, maybe there's something there where we can work together. Um, and so, you know, like whether that's on like the, the state level or the congressional level, like we're, we're trying to figure out like what's next? How do, we, how do we address more of these problems or how do we provide more of a systemic solution? But none of that would be possible if it wasn't for the, I think, informed experiences of the people that we're helping, the people that help us, and the people who care about the problem, which, I mean, like, I just gave you three pillars of people, which encompasses basically everyone. <laughs> and so um, it, it really does, you know, take a, take a village to make it work, right? Like, we, we, uh, we give away medical equipment, but, and our team right now is uh, seven strong with, with a couple of interns here as well. But um, it's seven people, but, you know, from, like, the, the medical device donors, like the hundreds of donors that give us the medical equipment to like the, the dozens of volunteers it takes to clean and refurbish the medical equipment before it goes to a patient, to um, the community partners that want to work with us and then my team connecting all those dots. It takes hundreds of people to get from point A to point B and that's how it should be, right? Like it's, uh, we can call them customers, we can call them clients, whatever, but the more people you can get on board with the idea, the more buy-in you have, and the more, um, I think, uh, feasible a lot of solutions become because you have more people on board and connections that you, as one person, would never have. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of like the, the lofty approach that I have to, uh, for Project Embrace in context of the next you know, 18 months to five years, but, yeah. That's interesting. You know, definitely some, some, some choices, right? Like I could see you going in either direction. And I, I think what's interesting is I guess, you know, before our conversation, I probably pictured you unfairly as like the, the entrepreneur, right? That all that really is going, like as long, as long as there's a really interesting problem, specifically probably a social problem, you're in it, right? But I think through this conversation, what I'm seeing is that it's, you are like, even going back to the experience that you had as a kid, right? you're very focused and dialed into, I think, what, what Project Embrace represents, right? And, and would you say that if another really fascinating, I don't know, social problem came along, mm -hmm. or maybe, I don't know, a different kind of problem that maybe doesn't have as big of a social impact comes along, would you, would you jump to it? Would, oh, you, yeah. would you take a look <laughs> at it? Yeah. yeah, I think, you know, like uh, Project Embrace has never been like the, ah, I made it, you know, like this is my summit. Yeah. I, I'd like to think that, you know, um, the, the way I kind of operate as a person, you know, like uh, the, the mountains of my moral landscape, like the things that never move, but will change with the seasons and change with my perspective, um, but again, are always there, are, is this fundamental belief in the advocacy, protection, and um, enhancement or advancement of uh, basic human rights. You know, I, I think like, uh, there's a, there's a lot of, I think, uh, circumstantial questionability around like what is good and what is bad. But for me, like the ultimate thing is, does this in fact protect um, or, or, or advance forward the idea of human rights and access to human rights for communities that, um, you know, like uh, that for communities that otherwise struggle um, with, with achieving those basic values, right? Yeah. Um, or, or protecting those basic values. And so, you know, like uh, Project Embrace, was, it, I, the opportunity was there, I chased it, it snowballed, and it grew, uh, but I don't see myself doing this like the rest of my life, you know? I, I'd like Project Embrace to be around the rest of my days, but um, me, you know, at the, at the head of the helm, like may, maybe not, um, you know, like ultimately again, like I, so I, I wanna go off to law school and, and, and uh, pursue that route and, and walk like the, the thin velvet rope of politics and, and push for greater causes and, uh, you know, whether that's, again, like women's rights, access to education, um, or, or healthcare in other ways, right? Or, or uh, civil liberties, like uh, LGBTQIA plus rights, like all of those things, environmentalism, I could just go off, right? Like, <laughs> so there's so many things I care about. 
Um, but they all, again, like the cornerstone of all of those things is routed in the idea of dignity and human rights. Mm. And so um, I, uh, I think that, that that's, you know, what, once the next opportunity presents itself, like I will gladly jump aboard, but I'm not, I'm not looking to just hop around, you know, like it, it's, I want to go, I want to do as much as I can and then build as much as I can. And then like when it's time to jump, like jump again and, and mm. do that and constantly evolve because, uh, you know, kind of like what I was saying, like with, with like the mountains and in our beautiful landscape of Utah, right? Like um, they're always there, but they change. They're always evolving. They're always different, right? Like they look different during the summer. The accessibility to the summit is different during the winter and blah, blah, blah. And so it's like one of those things where I think uh, in order to be effective in promoting social change and advocating for social good, you need to be as dynamic as that landscape and the terrain. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, uh, I don't know what exactly is next for me, but I do know that um, there are certain uh, things I need to do to, to be able to get to the next opportunity. You know, like uh, I'm a huge proponent of education and higher education, so like I'm very hell-bent on going to law school and uh, going to a place where I know I can make the right connections and meet the right people to, to advance myself. But um, yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, okay. yeah, for sure. Cool. <laughs> I, I mean, that was an amazing answer. And I think, so when you, I, I think we're about hitting time. Yeah. Was, was there any other question that you wanted to? I'm gonna, can I uh, plug a book? No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can plug a book. Yeah, which book? Um, well, I think if you haven't heard of the book, it's um, Chasing Confidence. Chasing confidence. Yeah, okay. By uh, Nate Walkinshaw, one of well, our guests. Oh, cool. Um, and he started his career off as a paramedic and uh, had a big failure at first when he designed a new product uh, for for uh, patients. Uh, and then he, you know, went on to learn how to really identify the problems um, that people have uh, and and then build solutions for those problems. But mm. uh, really great book. Um, I think in whatever anyone does in fact um i think it relates back to this and i'll say that the other thing that i thought of is i, I do i think whatever you do right hopefully um, project embrace continues to, to yeah. live on and makes a difference but i think that when you talked about the i think you're onto something with helping the don't donor uh understand the story and the impact it had on the actual receiver of the product, right? Mm -hmm. the, the patient, the customer. I think, you know, bringing to life those things in whatever you do with rights, mm -hmm. uh, storytelling for, for the whole journey for the actual person that donated, helped, support, I think is a, is a powerful thing to oh, be done. Absolutely. Rather than it being, you know, you put it into a black hole and who knows, maybe it made a difference, maybe it didn't. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's what made me think of. Um, that's, yeah. yeah, but I mean, we appreciate your time. Uh, we yeah. Thank you for yeah. It's made made us. I think our listeners are going to love the um, thought provoking um, concepts that we've talked about, and and also apply it to themselves. Like, what are they going to do? What are, what are they going to go away and explore a little bit more around and, and make it happen? Not just wait. Yeah. Do you see? Do they do? do they do thirty in their thirties? Is that where you're going to be? <laughs> Is that where you're going to be in five in five years? Or? I, th I think yeah. there's a uh, there's a uh, in Utah business. It's it's funny because uh, Sarah was on this list, right? Uh, it's forty under forty. Uh, okay. She was on that list too. So I don't know. We'll we'll see what happens. Was but she? I didn't know that. Yeah, it yeah. was a couple of years ago, and then she was CEO of the year last year. She's phenomenal. She's so cool. What a what a cool person to have. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know, like, you know, like, uh, whatever, like it's, it's not necessarily about chasing like the accolades oh, yeah, or the yeah. trophies, right? Like those all rust and they don't matter after a while, but it's, it's about trying to help as many people as you can along the way. If you can galvanize a crowd to join you on that process, then, then success will follow. Right. But it's not about chasing success. I should have absolutely said that because <laughs> through everything that you said in the, in this podcast, I could have said, okay, we'll see you in the 30 in your 30s or your 40 in your 40s because that's exactly the answer that I think somebody who will be there would would say. Oh, so, thanks. <laughs> yeah, man, for sure. But definitely check out that book. It's interesting because there's so many parallels, chasing especially confidence. yeah, chasing Love confidence. It. But yeah, amazing. Uh, last chance to say anything that you know people don't know about you. Uh, also, how can people get in touch with you yes. or you know and what how, why would they get in touch with you? Why would you want 
like donations of equipment, yeah. anything like that? Any, yeah, anything you want to put out into the world? Yeah, I, I'd say like the call to action we have right now is, you know, we're, we're as a nonprofit, we're constantly looking for awareness and, and it's uh, constantly looking for people to get involved, right? Like it's, uh, whether it's, you know, you, you have something you want to donate and you, and you talk to us about it and we, and we take it off your hands and, you know, like give it that second story. Or if it's, uh, you know, like financial contributions always help, especially for, for our business. Like we're really, really lean about it. Um, like it's, uh, like for, for example, like we're going out to the Napa Nation this December. It, it, will, it will cost my team a lean cost of $3,500 to take over $25,000 worth of equipment. You know, like it goes a really long way. Um, so that kind of awareness piece or contributing is, is huge, but um, even just to have a conversation, you know, I, I think like a lot of people have phenomenal ideas and I'm always looking for people to uh, just chat with. And so uh, the best way to reach us um, or to reach me is, uh, you know, we have our website, www.projectembrace.org. You can drop a line there. Our social media handles, our newsletter, like uh, all of our social media handles are basically at underscore project embrace. Uh, mine's Mohan the Brohan, so you know we appreciate a follow. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, thank thank you all for having yeah. me, and I, 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 it's it's been such an honor to talk to both of you, and uh, yeah, like uh, I just appreciate both of you, love both of you, so thanks for having me. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks for hanging out with us. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Swell Podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast, sign up to our newsletter at theswellpod.com, and get in on the conversation through all major socials at The Swell Pod. We'll see you next time.